Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Uh, please offer a warm welcome for Brandon S. of Visalia. Good evening, everybody. My name is Brandon, and I'm an alcoholic. Uh, is that better? All right. First of all, I'd like to thank Bill Haxman for asking me to speak tonight. I feel it's a privilege, and I'm honored to do so. And uh, with that, I am an alcoholic, for sure. I was an alcoholic at the age of 16, maybe younger. Uh, I was raised up in an alcoholic family where that was the norm. You know, my, my grandparents, uncles, dad, everybody on my dad's side, anyhow, and part of my mom's side were all alcoholics, except my mom, she never drank anything, never even got a speeding ticket till this day, you know. I think maybe she has one. But anyhow, <clears throat> uh, so I I started at a young age, you know, definitely an alcoholic by the time I was 16. By the time I was 20, I had four DUIs and on my way to prison, uh, turned 21 in Folsom, right, and uh did 18 months on a three-year sentence and was out 18 days after I got out before I went right back for my fifth DUI. So uh, so that's how it went. And I did another two years on that, and I got out, and then my addiction, it just, just escalated from there. You know, I started drinking more or getting into other things. Um Anyhow, so uh, it was easy for me to admit that my life had become unmanageable, you know, and that I was an alcoholic for sure. And um, where I'm at today, I, I, by the grace of God today, I have eight months clean. And I'm 47 years old. So, uh, you know... <clears throat> Really, I'm a little nervous, but, uh, and I'm just kind of winging this. Anyhow, uh, huh? life's great today, you know. Uh, I recently started a new job at, at PSC. It's out in Goshen. Anyhow, it's the best job I've had in my whole life, right? I'm 47 years old, just got this job, and... I got retirement benefits, everything. I've never had anything like that in my life. I've always, you know, been in construction or, you know, just doing side jobs here and there, whatever. Doing things I shouldn't have been doing, maybe, you know, for sure. <laughs> but, um, you know, and it's, the re I've been in out of recovery for a number of years. You know, I started going to the Alano Club with, 18 years old, right, after I got my first DUI, and I just, you know, I just come in, and I hated it, didn't want to go to the meetings, I used to go there and meet girls, drink at the meetings, would leave early, you know, and go full around and come back, pick up my card, uh, you know, and so, but it's been a learning process since then, you know, I believe, when I, even when I didn't want to go and I was there, I picked something up, and so the difference today is, like I said, it's a, I feel honored to be up here right now, even though I'm a little nervous. Uh, I love going to my meetings, you know. Uh, I enjoy I going to the, I'm in, I self, I self uh, enrolled in New Heights. I'm in aftercare there now, but I'm doing everything I can today to, you know, to stay sober, what I'm supposed to be doing. I don't, you know, I follow, I follow suggestions, and that's that's where I'm at. Why it's working for me today, because it's not a pain in my ass to go to the meetings. It's not a pain in my ass to be here right now, I, you know. Uh, I eat a lot of humble pie, and and that's that works for me, you know. I'm learning, because my way, 
I've tried it, you know, my whole life I've wanted to drink and be able to, ever since I was young, you know, everybody's drinking and having a good time, so I wanted to drink, and, but I couldn't have a good time because I never knew when to say when. And I had become belligerent, instant asshole, you know, I was the youngest and I had three older brothers to, you know, look, well, I had to live up to their reputation and my own, right? You know, so anyhow, <clears throat> um, always trying to prove that I could drink and, you know, that I could handle my booze and do it, and I couldn't. I, I, the bottom line is I cannot handle my booze. I have a, a lot of addictions, a very addictive personality. And even today, I'm learning, you know, I used to, going through the steps, I'm on step four now, but going through the steps, they would ask me questions like, you know, where's your, how is your addiction active in other areas of your life? I was like, what the hell does that mean, right? <laughs> I quit, you know, I'm not drinking, but I'm learning, you know. And, you know, from, I, I, it's, um, it's, it is active sometimes, and I catch it, but I, right now I'm just focusing on, I, I try to keep my life balanced. I get proper sleep. I eat right. I exercise, you know, on a daily basis, and I work. And so I try to keep everything, and I read, and I, I, go, to, I, know, I go to church on Sundays every morning. I start with morning meditation and prayer, you know. And uh, if I'm not reading out of the Bible, I'm reading out of the big book or just for today. I have a 12 by 12. Um, and I just try to stay focused and keep balanced. You know, I've had a lot of time. I, I have 11 years in state, actual 11, actual time, 11 years in state, right? And then that's not counting all the time I spent in county jail or road camp, and MCF. You know, I've, I've, I've been everywhere. I've done a lot of, you know, done a lot. To get there, but I had a lot of time, anyhow, to read self-help books when I was in, locked up. And like I said, it's been a learning process all the way from the time when I got my first UI till now. I've, there's little things that, even though I didn't know it, it, it became a part, <clears throat> part of my life. And, you know, it helps me today. And so it helps me uh, just, you know, take the good and leave the bad, right? So anyhow, I don't know how long I've been up here. <laughs> I didn't even look at the clock. It's 727 now. <clears throat> but, you know, I, I'm very happy today. Happier than I've been, I mean, honestly, my whole life. It's, and that's crazy, but it, it, I am very happy. And right now, and I'm, I don't even have my own place. I'm staying between my mom and my brother's house. Uh I don't have any money in my pocket, right? But I don't, I, I got cigarettes. I got, the only addictions I have today is cigarettes and coffee. I got cigarettes, coffee, gas in my car, and I'm happy to get up in the morning and go to work. I love it, man. I look forward to it, you know? And they hired me on at a company where I don't have a clue about, didn't have a clue about what was going on there. It's a Pacific Southwest container. They manufacture eight boxes, right? More than just a box, right? <laughs> Anyhow. <laughs> Anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm really learning a lot, you know. Catching on, I believe I'm catching on quick. I, there's a, and it's a team. I'm learning how to, you know, the, the, it's, I'm part of a team. On the, I work on a laminator. We make the boxes. They come, anyhow. They start off as rolls of papers. When they come out my side, they're stacked up on a pallet in their boxes, right? You got the liner, the corrugated paper, and the top line. Anyhow, I don't know why I'm going with that. <laughs> but, I'm just happy to be here. I'm happy to be sober. I have God in my life. You know, and that's another thing. I was raised up in a Christian family, so when it came time to do my steps, it's easy. I, I, my life is unmanageable for sure, man. You know, and, and then, <clears throat> you know, I made a decision to turn my, or I came to believe that a power greater than myself to restore me back to sanity. And I feel a little crazy right now, but. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, so I made a decision long ago to turn my care or turn you know my cares, my life over to the will of God as I understand Him. I understand Him a little different today than I did growing up in church, but it, you know it's, it's better understanding. And I have a conscious contact with Him, and I've had spiritual awakening. You know, I love my my higher power, um, and He loves me, right? I know that, and uh, you know this. 
last Sunday I was in church. I know it's not a religion, but I just share. I was in church last Sunday, and the, 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 it was about the good shepherd, and it's the four blessings of having a good shepherd, right? The four, the four blessings of having a good shepherd. The blessings of the shepherd is, that, you know, he, uh, he guides you. First one is he provides for you, right? Then he guides you, he protects you, and he uh, corrects you. That's it. So I, I implement those as being a father to my kids, and then just that's what, and that's also how my higher power helps me. My my higher power, you know, he guides me in you know, the way I should go when I don't know. All I gotta do is ask, you know, and uh, he definitely provides for me. I, there's no way I would have got this job if I wasn't doing what was right. I I believe that's all by the grace of God that I got this, you know, the job that I have and the stability and just everything. I have my license. I. I lost my license at 16, right? Well, I got it at 16, 17, I lost it, okay? Haven't had it since. I just barely got my license a couple months ago. So it's been like 30 years, you know? Um, you know, and he, he corrects me, you know, when I'm wrong, and definitely. And uh, he protects me from, you know, the things that could harm me for sure. And so... I'm very thankful. I'm thankful to my higher power to be here today um, for my, you know, for my girlfriend, Kristen, out there. And we have two little boys, beautiful kids. They're not here right now. They're at my mom's. But, uh, you know, that's what I'm doing today. I'm putting my life back together. Cause I, I, it took me 30 years to tear it up, but I'll tell you what, I'm, it's coming back together pretty quick, and I'm so thankful. And I owe to God, my higher power, and this, this program. Right. Thank you. Please help me give a warm Tulare County welcome to our main speaker, Vicki R. of Yuba City. Hi, my name is Vicki and I am an alcoholic. Um, incredibly nervous. There's a lot of you out there. Um, I want to start off by thanking Brandon for getting up here. You got a nice job. And I also want to thank Nikki, our signer. Okay. Um, thank you, Bill, for asking me to do this, I think. Um, so usually um, I, I get really nervous before I speak. It's just this thing that I do. Um, but I'm glad that I know some of you and I can look out. Um, and the people that I don't know, I know that you are just like me. Um, you know what it's like to be an alcoholic. You know... The, the fear and, and the despair, the sadness and, and the loneliness and, and uh, just the thinking that nothing's ever going to change. It's always going to be like this. And everybody in this room has felt that. And that makes me feel better about sharing my experience, strength, and hope because we're, we're all alike, even if I, if I don't know you. Um, so my sponsor always told me just to um, share from the heart, experience, strength, and hope. So um, in my experience, I was raised in a household that did not have any um, parental guidance. Um, my mother was a single mother. She had, she had my brother when she was 16. She had me when she was 19. And uh, she was at work all the time. Um, and so she left us with people that, uh, well, we'll just say that um, you shouldn't leave a little girl alone with people. Um, it was it was a horrible existence for me. Um, on top of everything else, I got beat up a lot, and uh, I was very poor. Um, 
I was thinking about that on the way over here. I love clothes. <laughs> and I'm thinking, why do I love clothes so much? It's because we would always go to the Goodwill store for our school clothes. And, and I didn't even know any better. I loved the Goodwill. <laughs> oh, goody, we get to go to the Goodwill. And then the, you know, the other kids would make fun of me, but it, it, it was a good experience for me at the time. Um, so... I thought that God hated me because I would see other families, uh, the mom, the dad, and, you know, they would have dinner at the kitchen table. And other kids would, would have brand new clothes on on the first day of school. And I wondered what that would be like. And I figured that God must love them and that he just didn't love me. Because if he loved me, he wouldn't let these things happen to me. And when I prayed, or actually when I begged for him to come and do something, he never did. And so I figured it was just me, that there was something very wrong with me. So... um what I what I did is I got very involved in stuff. I thought that maybe if I could just be good enough, I would get some love from somebody. Um, so I was a straight A student in school. I played every sport you can imagine: volleyball, tennis, basketball, softball, badminton, track <laughs> and I want you know and I made sure that I was the best person on the team because that was just my my mindset you know and and, and really um it didn't get me what I wanted but at least I had that um so when I had my first drink at 13 I was babysitting and cleaning people's houses, and this one family had a liquor cabinet. And there were all these pretty bottles in the liquor cabinet, so I took a tumbler and just poured a little bit, because I didn't want to get caught, you know, so I just poured a little bit of everything in this tumbler. And I held my nose, and I drank it down. <laughs> yeah, I did. And... Um, I didn't puke, which was really good. I didn't puke, but I got so drunk so fast. Um, um, the people came home. <laughs> they, they called my aunt, and my aunt came and got me, and I threw up in the back of her car. <laughs> and I couldn't wait to do it again. <laughs> You know, um, alcohol just, I think that it, I really think that it saved my life. Because when I was drunk or when I was drinking, I wasn't that girl. I was, I just pretended like I was somebody else. And it was good because I wasn't afraid. I wasn't sad. Um... I pretended that people liked me. It was really, really good. And I and um, I had gotten so depressed that I thought that I might kill myself because I couldn't imagine living another day. Um, and then I think that God gave me alcohol. Um, so... I never really wanted to do anything else but drink. Because <laughs> drinking was, was it for me. And by the time I was 15, I was an everyday drinker. Um, I still went to school. I still got straight A's. I still played my sports. Um, there was a couple of times that the coach wouldn't let me play because I was too drunk. <laughs> but she didn't report me. She just said, no, you don't get to play, Vicky. <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, so I was 15 years old and I met him. Yeah, he was so cute. He was 23 years old. 
um, blonde hair, big blue eyes. Um, he drove a 280Z, black, 1978 special edition. And I love that car. <laughs> um, he would pick me up from school, and, uh, you know, we just, we just really hit it off. And the thing about him um, was he acted like he cared. He asked me how my day was, and he asked me what I thought about stuff and, and how I felt. And I really never had that before. And um, I fell in love with him. Um, and I ended up marrying him when I was 18. Um, as soon as I graduated from high school, I moved in with him. And um, I really kind of felt like Cinderella, you know, that we're going to live happily ever after. And I found my Prince Charming and the whole thing. You know, um, people accuse me of being delusional. <laughs> now you know why. <laughs> I had this whole thing, you know. Um, anyway, what happened was, is um, things, um, we started, um, what do I say, we were, were entrepreneurs. And, and we, we, were, we were dealing in, in non-AA approved substances. <laughs> um, and things were good. <laughs> things were good for a while, you know. I was like his accountant. And, um, but, but things got out of hand. Things, things, things got out of hand. And we were drinking a lot and we were using a lot. And uh, so what, what happened one day is we were fishing. We were sturgeon fishing on the, on the Feather River and um, in a boat. And, and, and in order to catch sturgeon, you have to stay out all night. And it has to be like the coldest night of the year, so generally January, February, and then you 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 use your ghost shrimp and you freeze to death. Um, and that's what we were doing, but we had our alcohol and um, things were going well, and then all of a sudden they weren't. Um, he got mad about something, and he decided to make that boat go as fast as it could go. And I couldn't see the hand in front of me, so I knew he couldn't see. And uh, I was scared to death. And I remember crying and praying to this God that hates me to please get me home safe. And so when we finally got to the shore and I was walking on the dock, I heard this little voice say, Vicki, you can't do this. And I'm like, yes, I can. I can do this. This is okay. It won't happen again. Da 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 da. You know the things that we tell ourselves. And um, but the voice was adamant. Like, no, you cannot live like this. And um, it broke my heart because I had to leave. Um, and so he got remarried right away. <laughs> surprise, surprise. <laughs> um, and his wife was killed in a boating accident. Um, something happened and the boat overturned and he came out alive, but she didn't. Um, so I'm about 19 and um, I don't have anywhere or anybody or anything. Um, and no coping skills, so I found I should say I discovered men. I like to say people, places, and things, but that's just not true. <laughs> um, I discovered men, and um, they are such fascinating creatures. <laughs> um, so it started out... Um, at first, it was it was kind of olderish men, probably at that time forty, <laughs> um, <laughs> older men with money that um, treated me nice. I mean, they treated me real nice. They took me to to fancy restaurants and bought me jewelry and dresses and um, and it was good. 
It was really good, you know. Um, they take me to the finer places so I could drink. At the finer places, they didn't card you back then, so um, it was good. And to y'all, um, I turned into this stark, raving drunk that was not pretty. Um, you know, the nice guy would take me to this place and, and dress me up and feed me, and, and then there's a chance that I might not leave with him. <laughs> you just never knew when that was going to be. <laughs> um, and so the book talks about lesser companions. And I am a lesser companion magnet. <laughs> I, um, I, found, I found people that... Um, Wanted to beat me up, break my bones, slap my face, call me horrible names. Um, I ended up in the hospital once. I ended up getting my picture taken for employee of the year with two black eyes. Um, I thought that that's what I deserved because I came from a household like that and I just thought that this must be where God wants me because he hates me, and so this is where I am. And I, I also thought that um, I was somebody special because I could put up with that kind of abuse on a daily basis, you know, but I was drinking horribly every day, and that's the only way that I could do that. So what happened was is I got pregnant with my son, Taylor, Um and he was a beautiful baby. When they handed him to me in the hospital, I knew that this was it. This was it. This was the love that I've been waiting for. Um, I'm going to love him like I wasn't. And um, I just had such big plans for him, for us. Um, when I left the hospital, though, um, my disease ran rampant, and um, when he was two years old, Taylor's dad decided to take me to court for custody. And on the court papers, it said that I was a drug addict and an alcoholic, and that I did not deserve to have him. And um, I really wanted to go to court to fight for him, um, but I didn't have a defense. I didn't know what I was going to say. Um, so I didn't go. And when you don't go, they call it default, and the person doing the petition gets everything he asked for. And so they changed his name, and he was gone. So after that, I just continued on my downward. It wasn't even a spiral, really. <laughs> it was just more like a plummet. Um, so then I got involved with this other guy that um, liked to beat me up, and then I got pregnant with my daughter, Jessica. Jessica, she was, um, she was positive for, for drugs and alcohol. And um, CPS was there, Child Protective Service, and they, they wanted to take her. And um, I begged him. I begged him. I said, please, please, you can't take her. I love her. She's all I have. I promise I'll do whatever you say. I'll go to your treatment programs. I'll go to your meetings. Um, and they let me keep her. Um, and then we left the hospital. Um, so the book says that we won't, we won't regret the past, nor wish to shut the door on it. Um, but those next five years, I, I regret with all my heart. If there was a way to do that over, I would. So Jessica and I, we, we went, and uh, it was horrible. It was horrible for, for her. I left her with people. Um, 
I hooked up with 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 the biggest dealer of the day. Um, CPS was following us from county to county. <clears throat> I like to say that I moved, but I didn't really move because I didn't have any furniture. <laughs> I just <laughs> just went from from county to county, and they they kept uh, following me. So what happened was is I was um. I was the accountant again, and um, Net5 came. Net5 is a narcotic enforcement team, and they they don't knock. <laughs> they, they they have this big thing, and they just go like this, and they pound the door in, and here we are. Um, and that's what happened. Um, and with them was the local police and <coughs> CPS. And I knew that I was going to jail because I had a couple of warrants out. Um, and I knew CPS was here. But I knew I was going to jail, and I can't drink in jail. <laughs> so I grabbed my bottle and ran to the bathroom. And I stayed in that bathroom and I drank that alcohol as hard and fast as I can until the police officer came in and got me out. And it wasn't until I sobered up in jail that I thought, why didn't I use that time to tell Jessica that I love her? That it was going to be okay and not to be afraid? And um, the only thing that I can come up with is that I was completely powerless. It did not even enter my mind. The only thing that I thought about was, I'm going to jail and I can't drink. So I went to the jail and when I got out of jail, it's funny how that works because you don't own anything anymore <laughs> when you get out of jail. I don't know if anybody here, you guys all look so nice. <laughs> I don't know if anybody here has been to jail, but um, when you get out, <laughs> you don't have anything anymore. <laughs> all your friends clean you out. <laughs> and that's what happened. Um, and I didn't have anywhere to go. Um, I had used everybody up. Um, I always wanted something. I always needed something. I needed a ride. I needed a shower. I needed a drink. I needed some cigarettes. And people were tired of me. I would, I could see you in your house through your window. And I'd be walking up and knock on the door and you wouldn't answer it. <laughs> because you knew. You know, if you let me in, I don't, I don't leave. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have anywhere to go, and I'm going to ask you for everything you have. Um, and so people just didn't want me around. Um, so I stayed at the park. There's a little park behind Taco Bell um, in New City, and I and I slept there at night, and at, uh, I slept there during the day, and at night I dumpster dived. Now, all those years of sports finally paid off. <laughs> Because you got it's illegal to dumpster dive in Yuba City, <laughs> so you got to be quick. <sighs> you know, and you got to get enough cans and bottles to um, get your cigarettes and get your alcohol. Um, and the cops would come by the park and pick me up, and I'm like, "What I do?" And they're like, "We just we just want to keep you safe." And I, I, you know, the thought never even entered my mind that something might happen to me because I really didn't care. It's like, what? What can you do to me? What What could happen to me? I don't. I don't care. Um, and then they would pick me up, put me in jail, and then let me out at four o'clock in the morning, freezing cold, half sober, no cigarettes, and nowhere to go, and no one to call. Um, and for me, when I was looking out in that darkness, thinking, I got nothing. That is the um, pitiful, incomprehensible demoralization that the book talks about for me. It is that feeling that I had 
at that moment when I'm looking out in the darkness and knowing that I got nothing. You know, I don't have nothing out here, and I don't have nothing in here. Um, so I would go back to the park. So it was about this time that um, my my boyfriend's girlfriend suggested <laughs> that I go to treatment. I told her, I said, I don't want to go to treatment. You can't drink in treatment. And uh, she said, yeah, I know, I know, Vicki, but if you go, they have, they have warm beds. You can get a hot shower. They have three meals a day. You can go for 30 days, and at the end of 30 days, you can come back and hit this even harder because you'll be all rested up. <laughs> So, you know, she must have caught me at just the right time because um, I said, okay. Now, you have to keep in mind that I had no intention of, of staying sober. Um, so I went into that treatment facility so drunk and loaded that I thought it would last me the whole 30 days I was there. <laughs> I come flying in. <laughs> they, um, they put me in another room. They said I was a trigger to the other patients. <laughs> Just out of my mind. Um, so I was um, I was incredibly sick um, for the first ten days. You know, um, I hadn't I hadn't really drawn a sober breath in in years. There was one time that I spent like 12 days in jail, and then another time I spent seven days in jail. And at that time, my my blood alcohol level was so high, they, they, they were treating me for it. But when I went to treatment, they didn't treat me for it. And I saw some horrible things. Spiders coming out of the ceiling, and snakes under my bed. And um, I didn't hear anything that they were telling me um, until the 10th day. On the 10th day, I started coming out of it, and I heard them say, Vicki, you don't have to drink or use again if you don't want to. And I just looked at her and said, what am I going to do instead? And she said, we're going to show you. And I thought, right. <laughs> <laughs> That's really what I thought, you know. I she had me for a second, and then she lost me. <laughs> um, and but I'm glad she didn't say, "Well, you have to go to meetings, you have to get a God, you have to," do, you know. I'm, she didn't say any of that. She said, "We're going to show you," and I didn't believe her. Um, so then, about the fifteenth day, a different boyfriend um, came to visit me in, in treatment. And he brought alcohol with him. It was cream soda and vodka. <laughs> Can you imagine? And he had it in his side coat pocket, and he said he asked me if I wanted it. And I, and I remember my eyes just lit up, and I got so excited. It had been 15 days. It's the longest I'd ever been without alcohol. And um, yes, yes, I want it. So he said that he'd hide it in the bathroom, and then I would go in there, and I could drink it, and I'm like, yes. So I'm on my way to the bathroom, and the little voice comes in, and the little voice says, and then what? You're going to drink that, and then what? And um, so I stopped for a second, and I'm thinking, well, you know, I'm going to get kicked out of here. That's what's going to happen if I drink that, and then you know, I played it, and, I, and I'd go back to the park. <laughs> what else would I do? And um, I decided that if I was going to go back to the park, I was going to do everything I could. I was going to give this program my best shot. And then, when I fail miserably, like I was sure I would, I'll go back to the park. And that was my first step. <laughs> That's, that's what I figured. It was just my unwillingness to go back to the park without a fight. So um, they told me that I needed to get a sponsor, and I got a sponsor. 
And the first thing that she told me was that I needed to get a God. And I said, you don't understand. God hates me. Is there, is there any other thing, any other way? And she said, no. She said, you get a God or you go back where you came from. And, you know, I... I didn't know that there was another way. They didn't say anything about a higher power. She told me, get a God or go back. And so she let me create my own. And I created this God. Very tall, very handsome. (laughs) Um, But the main thing is that he loves me unconditionally. He loves me no matter what, no matter what I do, no matter what I say, and he loves me all the time. Um, because I've never had that from anyone or anything. And so that's what I wanted. Um, and then, you know, later we added some other things. He's, he's got a, he's got a great sense of humor and, uh, he likes country music. <laughs> and, um, what I can say about that is um, they told me to start praying, and uh, I didn't know how to pray. Um, and plus, by this time, I'm living in the homeless shelter um, with six other women, and so I would pray in the shower, and I would get down on my knees, and I would say, God, I hate it here. I miss my kids. I want a drink. And I would throw a couple of extra words in there. And, uh, amen. <laughs> that was our conversation at first, you know. And, and um, what happened was, is over time, we built a relationship. Um, it's honestly been the best relationship I've ever had. And I can say that very easily. Because, <laughs> um, you know, with relationships, it takes time and communication, and 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 that's that's how it is with me and my higher power. You know, I listen, and and he lets me talk, and then I let, I listen to him, and and uh, it's it's been like that. You know, um, for me to be up here talking is so scary, but my higher power is right here. You know, and he tells me, Vicki, it's okay. I'm right here. You'll be all right. He says, even if you're not, I'll be here when you fall. <laughs> you know, don't worry. And I, I do a lot of things like that. You know, I have a job interview on Friday for a promotion. And uh, who does that, right? So what happened was is I got this sponsor, and I, I made myself a god. And then um, I had 60 days. And so I called CPS and I said, it's my birthday. I was wondering if I could see Jessica. And she said, you didn't get your letter? And I said, no. She said, well, we've decided to terminate your parental rights. Um, and it was a pay phone, and I remember just leaving it dangling, and I ran outside just crying and One of the counselors came out, and she talked to me, and she said, you know, you have to make a decision if you're going to do this thing or not, with or without Jessica. So I decided I might as well keep going. I got 60 days. To me, that was a lifetime. (laughs) Welcome to all the new people here, because, you know, I know how you feel. (laughs) Um... So I decided I would go ahead and do this. Um, when I had six months over, I got involved in the Christmas party. They needed a decorations chair. And um, I raised my hand, and everybody clapped, and I thought, oh, this is so cool. But what happened was is, is I got to tell everybody where to put stuff and how to do it, and I really like that, and, um, but I got something I didn't expect. At the end of the Christmas party, I thought about all the laughter and all the joy and every, and all the fun that we had, and I felt a part of, because I was a part of that, and, uh, it felt amazing. I never knew what something like that felt like, and that was amazing. Um, so then, um, 
my home group needed an alternate GSR, general service representative, and I had no idea what that was. Um, I didn't have the two years that you needed, but I raised my hand anyway, and, and somebody in the group said, oh, she can't do it, she doesn't have two years. And the group said, oh, we'll waive that. And I thought, oh, you guys really want me. <laughs> I didn't know they didn't have anybody else to do it. <laughs> and then, like, literally two weeks later, the GSR resigns, and I'm the new GSR. Now, I'm thinking that this is going to be easy. My group is crazy. It's a frontline group. You know, we don't care about AA as a whole. <laughs> I was thinking this was going to be super easy, and the first thing they do is send me to PRASA. Pacific Region Alcoholics Anonymous Service Assembly. And that year, it was being held in Tucson, Arizona. And I was so honored that they, let, they wanted me to go and represent them. They put me on a plane. I'd never been on a plane before. Um, they paid my way. Um, so I wanted to be good. I wanted to be like best GSR ever. I, um, I went to everything. I wrote tons and tons of notes. I got home. I typed them all up, um, made copies, stapled them, and passed them out. And nobody read it. <laughs> but that was okay. That was okay because what happened was is I fell in love with general service. I fell in love not so much with the service itself, but with the people that it was in general service. They had such a, a light in their eyes and, and such a heart for, 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 for service, and, and I wanted what they had. Um, so then when it came time, I got elected um, district committee member for District 19. Then I got appointed finance chair for the area, which if you know me and money, that's crazy. <laughs> After that, I was elected um, secretary for the area, Area 7, California Northern Interior Area. And then I got elected chair. It still blows my mind. People voted for me. <laughs> they know not what they do. <laughs> um, then I got elected alternate delegate. And then um, I got elected delegate. And you guys sent me to New York for the annual conference. Put me on a plane. And you sent me there to represent you. Thank you. Um, so now I am what they call a past delegate, which means you do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> It is brutal. It is absolutely brutal. If you're used to, to, you know, every weekend and, you know, conference calls and, you know, and then all of a sudden it's nothing. I, I you know, I, I picked up a couple of... Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.